I have been uh, talking about the characteristics of musical theater and the development of American musical theater, that which is sort of our contribution to the theatrical world. F from somewhere early 1940s to the mid-1960s or so, a period of probably about 25 years, this period is frequently referred to as the golden age of the American musical. In fact, probably uh, most of the, or many of the titles which one thinks of when one talks about musical theater, and many of the titles uh, that perhaps uh, you have seen uh, or have been done uh, in uh, high schools or colleges or other organizations, uh, many of those uh, titles uh, have indeed come from this golden age of the musical. Uh, we talked uh, about and developed last time uh, at some length the, Roger, the team of Rodgers and Hammerstein and their first creation of Oklahoma. And following that uh, creation of Oklahoma, they were to continue writing uh, together from 1943 until 1959 up on the death, death of Oscar Hammerstein. In that period of time, uh, they produced uh, some titles which have remained among the great titles, great musicals uh, of the American uh, musical theater, uh, Oklahoma, Carousel, South Pacific, The King and I, and then their final work together, uh, The Sound of Music. And the sound of music, of course, uh, then became moved from the stage uh, into the film world uh, and became one of the most successful musical film musicals uh, ever made. There are many other titles that we could certainly come up with and talk about from this era. Uh, again, the, uh, another team uh, of uh, Lerner and Lowe uh, who uh, produced uh, Brigadoon, My Fair Lady, Camelot. And then there are uh, indeed uh, the great comic musicals, uh, and one should certainly uh, not uh, leave them out. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, carrying on the tra tradition of being musical comedy, but such titles as Guys and Dolls, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, Annie Get Your Gun, Damn Yankees, Hello, Dolly, and of course, musicals that also continued that tradition of celebrating American life and American tradition and American values uh, in such things uh, as Meredith Wilson's uh, The uh, Music Man. Uh, and in fact, uh, this uh, particular musical is one uh, in which there is the sole creator, uh, and that is that Meredith Wilson uh, did indeed uh, write the book, the dialogue, the lyrics, and the music uh, for uh, The Music Man. Also during this period of time, uh, we moved from uh, being musical comedy uh, into uh, the serious musical. Uh, and in fact, it is the very reason that eventually the word comedy uh, was sort of dropped uh, from this category and it simply became the musical because we had such things as uh, West Side Story, uh, which was uh, the Romeo and Juliet, the story from Shakespeare, the Romeo and Juliet story, uh, moved to uh, New York City, uh, 1950s, uh, and uh, to the uh, gang, line, gang, gang warfare uh, that uh, existed then uh, during that period of time. Uh, or uh, the musical Gypsy, uh, which uh, while certainly it has some funny moments in it, uh, is however uh, very much uh, about a mother uh, who is quite a monster, uh, a mother uh, who uh, drives her daughters uh, to live the life that she wanted but never had a chance to live, uh, and that is to be a part of show business. Uh, and uh, things like Fiddler on the Roof, uh, which again, which deals with the persecution of Jews uh, in uh, Russia, uh, and uh, eventually under in the Czarist period, uh, and then eventually, uh, which leads then 
to the uh, Jews being driven uh, out of Russia and immigrating uh, into other land. Now, all of these are uh, part of what we sometimes call the strong book musical uh, or, uh, or sometimes referred to as the organic unity uh, musicals. Uh, and that is that all, uh, every element here, uh, the music, the song, the dance, the dialogue, everything here is driven by in some way developing either the story or the characters who are a part of the story. All of these elements are integrated. And we uh, talked last time about how uh, Agnes DeMille sort of took that final piece, uh, and that is, in this case, uh, dance, an artistic dance, uh, and integrated it uh, into Oklahoma. So that we find then in all of these musicals that every, ele uh, every element uh, comes together here uh, to be a part of a totality, to be a part of uh, a uh, unity. Well, in all uh, movements, in all artistic movements, uh, they go through phases. Uh, and that is, they have a point at which uh, they begin, they develop, uh, they have a kind of full flowering, uh, and that is, is very nature-oriented here. Uh, they have a uh, flowering, uh, and then once they have reached that full flowering, then they go into uh, decline. Well, just as this is exactly what happens uh, in Mother Nature, uh, then the same thing happens in artistic movements, uh, and they have a point at which they reach a zenith, uh, and their full flower wing, and then at that point they move into their final stage, the stage of decline. Uh, and this is exactly what happened in the American musical, uh, and that is by the time we reach uh, the late 50s and into the early 60s, we begin to find, uh, with specifically uh, some of the ones I named earlier, but uh, Gypsy uh, and West Side Story, uh, we find then that that is, if anything, sort of the, the zenith uh, of this uh, organic musical story, organic character-driven uh, musicals here. And so then at that point, once we've reached that point, then we begin to find that it's necessary to find something else, to move on, uh, to move to a new movement, to move to a new uh, staging of some kind. And also uh, what we find here uh, is that both what was happening in American popular music and also what was happening in the American society of the time uh, begins to be uh, reflected in the problems that then the American musical begins to develop uh, by the end of the 1960s. Uh, by the end of the 60s, American popular music is no longer the sound uh, of the music uh, which uh, had developed uh, in the 20s and the 30s and continued on into the 40s and into the 50s and frequently what we still today call American popular song standards. Uh, but what now happens is that by the middle 50s and on into the early 60s, American popular music has changed. Uh, there, began to appear, uh, there began to appear on the scene artists like Chubby Checkers and Elvis Presley and then uh, and The Doors and then the invasion from uh, England with, uh, with The Beatles, with uh, Mick Jagger, with many other artists and that no longer sounds like American popular music. There is now a completely different kind of sound, but what happens is the American musical doesn't absorb that change. The American musical no longer uh, is, is a part of American popular music. It's still continuing into the same vein that it had been writing in uh, in the 40s uh, and the 50s. 
And so the writers of the American musical now are no longer the writers of American popular music as they had been uh, for almost the 50 years prior to that. There are now a whole new series of artists who are a part of the popular scene, uh, and that is no longer a part of the American musical. We also find that at this time, we are, uh, by the mid-1960s, we are at the beginning uh, of the Vietnam controversy. We are in a great period uh, of unrest uh, in American society. And that unity uh, which the American musical had was certainly no longer uh, a sign of the times that we are in. And most of all, those values that the American musical celebrated, and that is those values of American life, of uh, American philosophy, American belief. What we find is by the mid-1960s, all of those beliefs, all of those philosophies are being challenged, uh, are being upset. And so now we find that the American musical is perhaps exonerating and uh, writing musicals about values for which a great part of the society no longer even believes in. So we now find that the American musical is in problems. It is needing to find new forms. It is needing to find a new sound. Uh, and uh, it uh, needs to find a new way to go. But seemingly, the people who are working in the musical at this time are not, do not give an awareness of this. They are the writers who, yes, have come through the background of the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and they do not seem to realize that there is a need to change here. There begin to be signs that there are some uh, breaks that are coming, that there are some experimentation, some experimentation is going to take place. And maybe one of the first departures that we find is in 1966 uh, in the musical called Cabaret. Uh, music, uh, a musical with music and lyrics by uh, Kander and Ebb. Uh, the breakdown here, or the where Cabaret differs from uh, the musicals that have preceded it, is that Cabaret, while it is a book musical, uh, does indeed have a story uh, taken from uh, the story from uh, a book called Berlin Stories, uh, and uh, they are, the stories are set in Berlin in the 1930s, uh, the story of Sally Bowles. Uh, and uh, Sally Bowles uh, works uh, at a, a nightclub in Berlin called the Kit Kat Club. Uh, and, uh, but what we find then is that the story uh, of Cabaret is the story of Sally Bowles, but then within this story, there is sort of a framework that goes around that story, and that is the various scenes, uh, or maybe we should say the numbers that take place within the Kit Kat Club itself. Uh, and there is then an MC uh, within the Kit Kat Club. Uh, and it starts, in fact, with a very uh, direct uh, uh, invitation to the audience with his Wilkomen, his welcome, which is the opening number. Uh, and uh, the, um, the MC is moving the audience uh, into, into the world of Berlin uh, of the 1930s, the Berlin just before the rise, or during the rise, but before, during the rise of Nazism, uh, but before uh, Hitler has uh, taken power. And so the, the MC welcomes us into this world of which Sally Bowles is, is, is an entertainer. Now, the numbers that the MC uh, will do throughout the musical lie outside the story of Sally Bowles, by, by, by being outside, meaning that they frequently become songs which comment on situations that are developing within the story themselves. So these songs move 
outside of the story. They are not a part of uh, the organic unity. They are not contributing directly to, but instead are being outside that story and are now commenting uh, on it in some way or the other. What we also, also find here uh, is that uh, Candor and Ebb are drawing some uh, for the time when it was written for 1965, 1966, uh, that they are drawing some parallels between America and the unrest uh, that was going on in our country uh, at, in the midst, just starting in the mid-1960s, and what was happening uh, in Berlin uh, in the early uh, 1930s. What we have begun to do then here is we have begun to, uh, to fragment uh, this uh, structure that the particular musical is here, so that instead of it being an organic unity and everything tying together uh, in some way, we have begun to fragment this, and this is exactly uh, what uh, the musical cabaret does. The individual who is to uh, carry this on and who is to become uh, the American master of musical theater uh, from uh, this period in the, the mid-1960s uh, down to the present day uh, is Stephen Sondheim. Now, Stephen Sondheim was born 1930. Uh, he, uh, as, a, uh, as a boy, uh, he was uh, family friends with Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, he was friends with the sons of Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, and uh, Sondheim uh, adored uh, Oscar Hammerstein, and Oscar Hammerstein became a kind of surrogate father uh, to him uh, after uh, Sondheim's parents divorced. Uh, and so, uh, but Sondheim uh, felt that he wanted to write musicals, and he certainly, and he asked Hammerstein uh, to help him. Uh, and in many ways, Hammerstein uh, was certainly one of the major influences on the development of Sondheim as a writer. And certainly many of the things that Hammerstein, uh, that Sondheim learned about writing lyrics, uh, he learned uh, from Oscar Hammerstein. But uh, Sondheim was not content to continue the writing the same kind of musicals that Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, had written, and instead he wanted to branch out and to push the limits of what could be accomplished uh, in the uh, American musical. Uh, one of the first musicals in which uh, he wrote both music and lyrics uh, is the farce musical called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Uh, and it has remained down to the present day uh, one of the most successful musicals uh, that Sondheim uh, has, uh, has written, successful that is in terms of a uh, number of productions and the money uh, that it has earned uh, Sondheim uh, as a uh, creator. Uh, however, uh, that which we uh, basically know Sondheim for uh, will be the musicals that he started writing and developing uh, starting in 1970 with the musical Company. Company, uh, Company is one of those musicals, again, that is now breaking down the organic unity uh, that was present in the earlier musicals. Uh, in fact, uh, Company is sometimes referred to as the first concept musical. Uh, and by concept meaning that the unity here, or that which, or maybe we better put it this way, that which ties the musical together is not necessarily a strongly developed story, but is instead uh, an idea or a concept. Uh, and in this case, uh, the concept is a married life. Uh, and what we see in the musical then uh, is Bobby, uh, who is a bachelor, uh, Bobby who finds it difficult to commit himself, uh, Bobby who has what in the early 1970s perhaps was called narcissism, uh, Bobby as an individual finds it very difficult uh, to make a true commitment to any single individual. 
And what we see developing in company then is a series of scenes uh, in which Bobby and his various married friends, and there are five couples here, uh, and each one of them has a particular scene with Bobby uh, when Bobby is visiting them or Bobby is out with them in some way uh, or the other. And what we get then is a rather acerbic view uh, of married life. Uh, and Bobby sees this uh, with each of these couples. Uh, and uh, the musical takes place at the point at which supposedly all of these couples are coming together to give Bobby a surprise birthday party. And by the end of the musical, Bobby hasn't shown up. Uh, and the, at that point, the friends all recognize uh, that Bobby isn't coming and that they need to leave Bobby alone and that he needs to find his own way of making his own commitment. And the last song in the show, uh, which is Bobby's called Being Alive, uh, is uh, where all of these various strands uh, are brought together uh, by Sondheim uh, in the music and the lyrics here uh, of this title song. This particular musical was extremely successful, uh, both uh, first in New York, uh, then, uh, then in London. Uh, it uh, set a tone, and it certainly in many ways set the American musical uh, on, uh, on its, uh, on, turned it upside down and set it uh, on its head. Um, Sondheim was to continue then with a whole series uh, of uh, experimental musicals of some kind or the other, uh, each one of which was an attempt to push the musical farther, to make the musical somehow or the other, see what else it could do. Where does one go when one moves away from or from the strong book musical, from the story-centered musical? What does one do uh, from uh, company followed by uh, Follies, uh, and Follies uh, in many ways uh, is uh, called the musical in which Sondheim has deconstructed uh, what the American musical uh, is all about. It is also in some ways his homage uh, to the American musical because throughout the musical uh, he writes various numbers that echo uh, the, what, the music, what the music of American musical was like uh, from uh, the turn of the century into the 20s, into the 30s, into the 40s, uh, but setting all of this into uh, the period of the 1970s when this particular musical was written. Then came uh, a little night music. In some ways, a little night music uh, may be uh, Sondheim's operetta, uh, because among other things, the task that he set out for himself here uh, is to take three-quarter time music, uh, and that is that which was the basis especially of the Viennese operetta uh, of the 1880s and then again right at the turn of the century. Sondheim now uh, experiments and sees what can he do in writing every piece of music in the show in three-quarter time uh, and what can he do there uh, and it's very much uh, in the vein uh, of an operetta and the, and the Viennese operetta. Uh, it is also uh, from A Little Night Music that the song which perhaps has become the best known of all songs that Son Sondheim has written uh, comes from uh, and that is the song Send In the Clowns. Uh, then comes a musical called Pacific Overtures, uh, Overture. Uh, and uh, in this case, this is an experiment to see what happens if one, one writes a musical uh, about the period when uh, the Americans visit uh, Japan for the first time in the 1850s, uh, and you take that as the subject, and you combine that with Japanese kabuki staging and you write an American Western musical about this. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful musical. Uh, it was not to everyone's taste. 
uh, but uh, certainly, again, experimenting to see what could be done uh, with it. Then comes Sweeney Todd. And Sweeney Todd is perhaps here uh, where Sondheim is at his uh, most operatic, uh, that is, especially in terms of the music that he wrote here. Sweeney Todd is a story about, uh, taken from a 19th century melodrama uh, of a barber called Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. So taking that 19th century melodrama uh, and turning it into a modern American musical, uh, but also because of the melodramatic nature of the story, uh, giving it uh, very much uh, the songs uh, which begin to have a very operatic uh, tinge about them. Uh, Sunday in the Park with George uh, comes in the early 1980s. Uh, and in this particular musical, uh, it is a, a musical about artistic creation. Uh, and using the uh, French uh, artist uh, Georges Seurat, uh, Seurat uh, Sondheim writes a musical uh, about uh, George uh, and the great painting uh, that uh, Seurat did, uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday on the Grand Jatte, uh, a painting uh, that he did. And this musical is, a, is, in the first act, about the creation of that particular uh, painting. Uh, and throughout this musical, uh, the uh, Seurat was what was called a pointillist. Uh, and by pointillist meaning uh, he painted in little dots, and one dot next to another dot, next to another dot, next to another dot, next to another dot, next to another dot. And then when they all, when, it, when the whole thing is finished, one can then see the complete painting, but it was done one dot at a time. And Sondheim finds music to use that reflects uh, and it gives a musical sound to the pointillist technique uh, of uh, the painting. Uh, then comes uh, what is uh, what has become uh, the second or uh, the other most popular musical that Sondheim has written called Into the Woods. Uh, and Into the Woods uh, is a wild experiment uh, in which uh, Sondheim and uh, his, uh, the man who wrote the book for him, James Lapine, bring together various grim fairy tales. And what happens if you cross all of these fairy tales, Jack and the, Bean Snow, Jack and the Beanstalk, Cinderella, Snow White, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, and you cross all of these stories uh, in the first act of the musical, and at the end of the first act, we are where all of those uh, fairy tales are, and everybody lives happily ever after. But then comes Act Two of Into the Woods, and now we have moved beyond that moment, and we begin to find out that now most of these characters do not have a uh, finding that the dream that they had at the uh, end, where everybody lives happily ever after, is not uh, how uh, they develop at all, and that one does not live uh, happily uh, ever after. Uh, Samhain also uh, wrote the musical called Assassins. Uh, and again, uh, here uh, working with a playwright by the name of Jerome Weidman, uh, they brought the idea of what happens if you bring together into one musical uh, those various people who have attempted to assassinate uh, the various U.S. presidents. Uh, so with John Wilkes Booth, uh, and all of the other assassins uh, here, they come together in this one musical uh, and they cross their paths uh, and develop into uh, a fascinating musical, uh, which some people have found very, very disturbing uh, because uh, perhaps they look and think that what uh, Sondheim and Weidman are doing here is they are uh, glorifying, that, uh, glorifying the assassins and that is not what they are doing at all. Uh, what they are doing is looking at what, how has violence been a part of American society by specifically looking at then how has the violence uh, that has been uh, attempted at uh, on the various American presidents, 
how is that a symbol of the violence in American society? Certainly, none of the musicals that Sondheim write uh, are ever simple. Uh, they are uh, very complex, uh, and every one of them has, in some way or the other, attempted to see what could be done with musical form uh, and how uh, could it be pushed, how could it be uh, experimented with. Uh, and even down into the 21st century, uh, now with Sondheim into his 70s, uh, he is uh, still working uh, on uh, musicals. Uh, and uh, is still working on the Broadway musical and is still experimenting and pushing it to see uh, what can uh, be done here. Because in many ways perhaps what Sondheim does is with every piece that he creates that it is so superb uh, that there is no way to improve upon it. So in many ways while Sondheim is indeed the American master uh, of the musical for the last uh, 30 years or more. Uh, the path that Sondheim has broken has not been easily followed uh, by other uh, individuals. And so Sondheim did not necessarily always open up new paths for other people to follow. Sondheim opened new paths, but also at the same time sort of closed them off uh, with that particular work because it was so individually great within itself. What we also find during this period uh, is that now we begin to drop American from the word the musical. Uh, because starting again in the 1970s, we begin to have uh, the English uh, invasion uh, of the American musical. Now, the American musicals, and especially the musicals of the Golden Age, were extremely popular uh, in London. Uh, in fact, uh, when uh, the famous Drury Lane Theater uh, in, uh, in London, which had, been, which had a heavy uh, bomb damage uh, during World War II, uh, when it was uh, restored and rebuilt uh, and reopened in 1947, that work which was chosen to celebrate the opening uh, of the historic uh, and beloved Drury Lane Theater was indeed an American musical Oklahoma. Uh, and the Drury Lane Theater continued to be the home uh, to American musicals for uh, many years uh, thereafter. So the American musical became very much uh, a staple uh, in London West End, and the London West End is the home of the uh, commercial theater in London, just as Broadway uh, is the home of the commercial theater uh, American theater uh, and mu musical theater in New York. Uh, the counterpart to it uh, in London is called the West End. And American musicals were enormously popular uh, and continue to be uh, down to the present day uh, and are uh, frequently and often produced uh, in the uh, English theater. But um, there have been a few, few writers uh, of English musicals themselves, but it was finally to be starting in 1971 uh, with the work of the composer Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, and his lyric writer Tim Rice uh, that the true English invasion of the American musical was to take place uh, to such an extent then uh, that now uh, certainly by the 1990s and into the 21st century, uh, no longer is it the American musical, it's now just the musical. The first musical uh, that was produced by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice uh, is Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, and uh, it is indeed, uh, as indicated here, uh, the basic uh, story uh, of uh, the um, uh, the uh, life of Jesus Christ uh, here. It is told through a series of songs. Uh, and by that meaning, uh, it has no dialogue. Uh, in fact, it is what we now call a through-composed work. 
Uh, it has no dialogue in it. We simply move from one song to another song to another song to another song. But, and here begins to be the great difference uh, that, uh, that we're talking about, and that is that Andrew Lloyd Webber, who was born uh, in 1948, uh, grew up then on what? Grew up on rock music. Grew up on the English rock uh, of uh, the Beatles, uh, of Mick Jagger, of the many other uh, English rock musicians. And so therefore, when Andrew Lloyd Webber then turns to writing musicals, uh, it is not the sound of American popular music that he is going to turn to or that he is going to use as a model. Instead, it is going to be that music which he grew up on. And so what we find then is that with Jesus Christ Superstar, that he brings then the sound of the rock music to then the musical. Uh, and so therefore, but what we find is that Lord Weber, and by the way, that is one of those uh, unhyphenated double last names that the English uh, are so frequently uh, fond of. Uh, but uh, what Lloyd Webber uh, does is that it is a very, very eclectic sound. Uh, it, in fact, it doesn't even have a unity uh, of sound to it. So that instead, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber brings in rock, and he brings in calypso, and he brings in folk, uh, and he brings in uh, the, the ballad from uh, popular music. Uh, and all of these are grandly mixed uh, in this uh, particular work. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar uh, is followed uh, with uh, the work called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Now, in actuality, Joseph had been written before Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, but uh, it, had, uh, it had not been written for or any thought of being uh, produced. Uh, it had been written for uh, a, uh, as a kind of uh, uh, a performance a piece for a, a school group uh, to use uh, in a music concert. Uh, but after the great success of Jesus Christ Superstar, Lord Weber and Tim Rice went back to it and what had been originally uh, about a uh, 25 or 30 minute piece. Uh, they now uh, expanded uh, on it uh, and developed it uh, into a uh, full length uh, work. Uh, and uh, then at that point, it was picked up and it was turned uh, into a musical. Now, actually, neither of these began, I, I should say, began life, uh, that is Jesus Christ Superstar, and uh, Joseph and Maisie Technical Dreamcoat, neither really began uh, with the idea of being musical productions. Uh, in fact, uh, when they were first, their first, I guess one would say their first uh, life uh, was as a concept record album. And this was what they were intended to be. Uh, because again, remember, Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, and Tim Rice didn't come through uh, this uh, tradition of the American musical. Uh, and so instead, they were simply thinking in terms of writing a series of songs which would be put on, out on a record album, which would then become a bestseller and make them lots of money. Uh, and it was uh, only after the record albums that then uh, theater producers began looking at it and saying, well, you know, I think this can be turned into a musical production. Uh, and first, Jesus Christ Superstar, then Joseph Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, uh, and then uh, followed uh, with uh, another musical, uh, another sort of uh, song cycle uh, a la musical called uh, Evita. Now, all of these are through composed. Uh, by that meaning, again, there's uh, little, uh, all, little or no dialogue uh, and no real uh, scenes, dialogue scenes that happen between characters. Everything happens uh, within the songs. Uh, and so therefore, uh, we move from song to song to song, uh, sometimes solo numbers, sometimes duos, sometimes 
uh, chorus numbers, uh, but we, simp we move from the song to song rather than having any kind of dialogue scenes that uh, develop here in some way or the other. After uh, the work with uh, Evita, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice uh, split. Uh, Tim Rice goes on and, and, ha and does other uh, works, musical works, uh, and Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, then turns and begins to look around for a new source. He finds inspiration in turning to some poems uh, that had been written by the American-born but became uh, English uh, poet uh, uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, and a collection of poems that T.S. Eliot had written called Cats, uh, or about cats. Uh, and so uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber got permission from uh, Eliot's widow uh, to take some of these poems and to uh, began writing songs uh, about them and to develop it into uh, a production. Uh, and in uh, 1981, uh, along with the director, uh, Trevor Nunn, uh, who uh, worked uh, with, uh, with uh, Lord Weber here, uh, they uh, developed then what has become the most successful and popular musical of all times called Cats. Uh, now, in this case, there is very little story involved. Uh, each of the songs uh, is about a different uh, particular kind of cat, uh, and uh, the songs then all come together to form a, a totality of the musical. Uh, what happens here is, uh, if there is any story, uh, it is uh, how uh, the uh, alley cat uh, Grizabella uh, can perhaps for her a dissolute life that she has uh, lived here, uh, that she can find uh, redemption uh, in some way, uh, which leads to then the, the climactic moment in the musical uh, when uh, Grizabella sings what has become perhaps uh, certainly one of the most popular songs that uh, Lord Weber has written and has certainly moved into uh, the pantheon uh, of, uh, of songs. Uh, and that is the song, Memories. Uh, Cats uh, continued uh, and after its London production uh, opened. Uh, then within the year, uh, the New York uh, production opened, uh, and the uh, production was to play uh, in, uh, on Broadway in New York uh, for uh, more than 20 years, uh, and in London uh, was to continue uh, for nearly uh, 25 years. Uh, and, by that, and by that, please realize we're talking about eight performances a week, 52 weeks a year. Uh, and in New York, it ran on for a little more uh, than 20 years. Uh, we find this musical playing. Uh, it, of course, then also toured throughout the country uh, and uh, certainly is uh, a musical that perhaps has been seen by more people than any other musical has ever been seen. Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote uh, other uh, musicals, but uh, in 1986, uh, he took uh, a, a highly uh, dramatic work, uh, a French novel, uh, and turned it into a musical called The, Phan the Phantom of the Opera. Uh, and uh, again, The Phantom of the Opera looks as if it is certainly uh, has every chance of following on uh, the great success uh, of, uh, of Cats uh, and continues to be uh, down into the 21st century uh, a, uh, still a popular work uh, in both uh, New York uh, and uh, in, uh, in London. Uh, in Phantom of the Opera is in many ways Andrew Lloyd's Weber uh, opera. Uh, uh, that and the next work uh, that he wrote after that uh, in the 1990s called Sunset Boulevard. Uh, both of those uh, certainly began to sound far more operatic, that is, in terms of the sound of the music uh, and the, uh, the rock sound and the rock music uh, of the early works of uh, Superstar and Joseph and Evita. All of that has been, has been left behind, uh, and Andrew Lloyd Webber is now exploring 
uh, new sounds uh, and new ways uh, in which uh, to make uh, what to do with uh, quite melodramatic and romantic uh, subjects. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, people who played one of the uh, stars who played the lead role uh, in Sunset uh, Boulevard, uh, Betty Buckley, uh, in her concerts, uh, she usually sings uh, either one, there are two big songs that uh, the leading character has in Sunset Boulevard, uh, and Betty Buckley frequently uh, includes them uh, in her individual concerts uh, that she gives across the country. Uh, and in whenever uh, she introduces uh, one of those songs, she calls it the aria, uh, using that operatic term uh, for uh, what is a song. Uh, Betty Buckley calls it uh, the arias that Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, wrote uh, in Sunset uh, Boulevard. We also find uh, now uh, with the English invasion, uh, we have uh, a kind of uh, French uh, invasion, uh, although in this case it's sort of a French invasion uh, coupled with uh, sort of uh, an English uh, tone to it also. Uh, but specifically, uh, another extremely successful musical uh, of the period, opening in 1985 uh, and uh, still continuing down to the present day uh, in productions uh, in both New York uh, and, uh, and in London, uh, is the musical called Les Miserables, uh, or usually referred to as Les Mis. Uh, and this, uh, in particular case, was a musical that was first uh, written and presented in Paris uh, by Alain Boublil and Claude Michel Schoenberg. Uh, and uh, they wrote uh, this work uh, based on the great French novel Victor Hugo and presented uh, the work uh, in, uh, in Paris. Uh, the English uh, producer Cameron Mackintosh, a uh, great uh, London producer of musicals, uh, saw the work uh, in Paris uh, and at that point then uh, set up a contract uh, with uh, Boublil and Schoenberg uh, for them to work with an English writer and that they would now do a translation and sort of English size, I suppose one could say, uh, this uh, work uh, of Les Miserables. Uh, also then bringing in uh, the director, Trevor Nunn, uh, remember I mentioned Trevor Nunn, who had worked as a director and also uh, had done some lyric writing for Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats. So Andrew Lloyd Webber, I'm sorry, Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, Trevor Nunn uh, now comes in uh, into the scene, uh, brought in by Cameron McIntosh, and he also works uh, with Boublil and Schoenberg, uh, and uh, they then take this great sprawling novel uh, about, uh, not about the French Revolution uh, that we think of of the 17, of 1789, the 1790s, uh, but instead uh, a later period uh, in which the French public uh, were in revolution uh, of 1848. Uh, and so uh, taking then Les Miserables, turn it into this great, huge, epic, sprawling musical. Uh, and uh, it opened uh, in London, it was enormously successful. It then uh, opened in New York, was enormously successful, and uh, opened uh, in many, many productions uh, throughout uh, Western Europe, and in fact, uh, throughout most of the, uh, the Western world. Uh, the team of uh, Boublil and Schoenberg uh, also wrote another musical called Miss Saigon, uh, and in this particular case, uh, the musical uh, using, a, uh, using the same material uh, that uh, the opera composer Puccini uh, had used in his opera uh, Madama Butterfly, uh, the, uh, these two took that story uh, of the American sailor who goes to Japan, uh, takes uh, a, a Japanese woman as his wife, uh, and uh, who then leaves behind her uh, not knowing, leaves her behind, returns to America, uh, not knowing that she is pregnant uh, and gives, and that she is giving birth, has, will give birth to uh, a son. Uh, they took this story, 
moved it from the period of the Belasco play, the Buccini opera, uh, and move it instead to America, Vietnam uh, of the 1960s. And now, instead of the sailor, uh, it is the American, um, uh, it is the American soldier, uh, and instead of a Japanese woman, uh, it is a Vietnamese woman, uh, and, but the story still uh, plays itself out uh, there. So as you can see, we have come down uh, to the 1990s into the 21st century, and what we find is that the American musical is indeed uh, floundering, uh, and that is that uh, it is not sure where it is going. Uh, and the new composers and the new writers uh, are uh, experimenting uh, and trying to find what is now the musical going to be uh, in the uh, 21st century. And what we find here as we look at it, we can begin to see uh, that uh, so far as the musical productions themselves are concerned, not necessarily what is being written, but in terms of what is now being produced by groups through across the country uh, who are doing American uh, musicals, what do we find uh, is that there are sort of three things that are happening here. One, uh, you could, we could call it mining the past. And by mining the past, uh, what we mean is, among other things, is looking at the music uh, uh, not necessarily the music of musicals, but looking at the music of uh, our past, uh, of the 20th century, what was popular at the turn of the century, what, was, uh, what did various composers uh, who wrote popular music, what music did they, uh, did they uh, write, uh, and uh, drawing these various uh, music, these songs and music together, uh, have put them, get, put them together uh, in uh, various uh, reviews of one kind or the other. Uh, Ain't Misbehaving, Sophisticated Ladies, uh, UB, uh, all of which uh, are uh, musicals that have, uh, looking at the composers, especially American, uh, African-American composers, uh, looking at the music that they uh, have written uh, and then constructing reviews around them. So mining the past, using uh, music of an earlier time to create new musical reviews. Uh, the second mining of the past is revising and updating earlier musicals, uh, frequently realizing that the books uh, or the book that holds that musical together is now badly dated uh, than perhaps uh, writing new books for it or using the basic book but now updating it or changing it uh, in some way or the other, uh, revising it uh, in such a way. Keep the music, keep the songs, but uh, rework the book uh, so as to make it more compatible for present day audiences in some way. So thus we find mining the past by revising and updating early musicals. Or, and the third, which is certainly uh, fairly obvious, uh, and that is doing new productions of past successful musicals. So therefore, uh, we find uh, that Oklahoma uh, will be given a new production uh, in the 1980s, and then we come at the end uh, of the end of the 21st century, and there'll be another new production of Oklahoma, and many other great musicals we are now recognizing. The musical has a history. The musical has a heritage. The musical has great works, just as in the world of opera, uh, they constantly are doing new productions of the operas of Verdi and Puccini and the other great opera writers. Then what is happening today is we are now doing new productions of past successes. Two, mining the past, one. Two, the other, what we also find is that many of the writers uh, are moving the musical much more toward operatic forms, and that is the through composed pieces of some kind, uh, or the song cycles, or in some cases, just the sound of the music itself. And as I mentioned earlier, Sunset Boulevard, uh, in which uh, indeed the, uh, some of the songs in there are comparable to arias from opera uh, and very much have that particular kind of, of sound. 
three, uh, what we find then is the continuation of pushing the limits of the book musical, combining it with other forms, trying to see what, kind, what can we do to take the musical and now continue what was successful, but now make it still something which is new, which is fresh, and experimenting with it in some way or the other. So as we are here in the 20th century, at the 21st century, what we're now doing is uh, we are mining our past. We are in many ways exploring how musicals and opera and operatic nature may be close to each other and then experimenting and seeing what is it that the musical is doing and where is it going and that is one of the interesting things that is happening in the 21st century and that is where is the musical going it is no longer musical comedy it is no longer the american musical it is now the musical of musical theater and what is going to happen with it and what is it going to be doing in the next 10 to 20 years.